You have the moral responsibility if you know that your company, your product or service is going to make a bigger difference in the life, the outcome, protect, enhance, enrich, uh, whatever it's going to do. You can't let the prospective person not use you. You can't let them choose an alternative that's not going to be as effective. You can't let them buy less than they should and less quantity, quality, or frequency, not because you're going to be the loser, but because they are. It's a pretty cool concept. So Jay Abraham is, uh, he's referred to as the $21.7 billion man and highest paid marketing consultant, maybe in the world, a proven business leader and top executive coach in the United States. As founder and CEO of the Abraham Group, Inc., which is in Los Angeles, Jay has spent his entire career solving complex problems and fixing underperforming businesses. He has significantly increased the bottom lines of over 10,000 clients in more than 1,000 industries and over 7,200 sub-industries worldwide. Jay has dealt with virtually every type of business scenario and issue. He studied and solved almost every type of business question, challenge, and opportunity. And uh, Jay's just a dear friend of mine, just a great guy, and it's wonderful to have you here, Jay. So what did I not say about you that uh, really people should know before we kind of launch into it? Uh, That I am a poster boy for adult attention deficit, and I can go rogue very easily. And yep. I'm going to start before you even, I, I heard uh, the, the young lady talking about people who had sales forces. Did a lot of them raise their hand? I, well, I, that was, I just walked in on that video during the lunch break. So I'm not oh. sure the last part you saw. Oh, okay, because I thought it was live. I didn't know that. That's why I was in the other room uh, writing something, but I was, I've got some ideas if people have that. So see, I'm already going rogue, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing to appreciate about me is I know very little about what all your people know about, but I've done a thousand different industries literally in my life, not businesses. And it gives you a really broad context of alternative realities, uh, a myriad of different strategic ways to think, business models, value propositions, monetization, redeployment. And that's probably... Uh, I'm imagining what you're going to want me to talk about or what you're going to ask or what we're going to discuss. So that's just the context. Don't think me being someone saying, I know more about what you guys are specialists in than you do. I don't. But I know a lot of stuff that most people don't. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, Well, we've got, you know, me and uh, you and uh, Dean Jackson did a really great interview right when this pandemic started. And a lot of people have commented on how valuable and helpful that was uh, to them. We put it on the I Love Marketing podcast. So Dean Jackson is here with us. And Dean, at some point, pipe in. You and Brian Kurtz have been friends forever. You're friends with quite a few people on here. And Jay, I believe your current consulting rates are 120 grand a day. Yeah. Okay. So if anyone wants to hire Jay, he's, he's available. Maybe. Maybe he's available. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, I'm just going to ask you, uh, how should business owners be thinking about this crisis in terms of risk and opportunities? Okay, so I'll share with you five or six really cool distinctions that I've talked about a little bit, so people might have heard it in some other forums, but they're really unique uh, perspectives on what I'll call mental arbitrage. So the first thing is, I mean, this is very, very trite. But I, I think in terms of dyads and, and triplets. So dyads mean I want to divide and conquer. So there's two types of attitudes. There's <clears throat> there's reactive, defensive, uh, 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 readiness, and then there's proactive, strategic, opportunist, ethical, opportunistic uh, preparedness. So let's assume that everybody we're talking to is in the latter, not the former. <clears throat> so what I look at are opportunities, correlations, implications, anomalies, nobody else is perceiving. So I think I'll go through uh, this very quick, what I'll call five-part distillation. Number one, I don't think there will ever be another window of opportunity. By the way, if I look up, I'm just accessing my thinking. I'm not trying to be rude to anybody. I don't think there will ever be another window of opportunity as wide, deep, and receptive as there is right now for doing collaborations, joint ventures, uh, uh, strategic alliances, endorsements, co-branding, referrals, 
uh, of, the, uh, of the most wide magnitude. You can take me deep on anything you want. And I'm not talking about, and no disrespect, a typical affiliate deal. I'm talking about much richer, deeper, much more uh, involved and, and sustainable. Number two, <clears throat> there's never going to be as many companies that have been as ill-prepared financially and are going to be against the ropes and in dire probability of either having to very barely make it or go broke, and there'll never be as big an opportunity to acquire, not businesses, you don't need the yoke of liability, but the assets, the buyers, the prospects, the distribution channel, the URL, the phone numbers, uh, any key personnel. Number three, uh, and this is really interesting, is that uh, there are now, I think, 22 million people unemployed. If you look at it, Joe, it's polarized top and bottom. There's a large number, <clears throat> pardon me, one second. <clears throat> There's a large number yeah. of unskilled people, which for this discussion are irrelevant, but they're very relevant human beings, men and women, fathers, mothers, husbands, et cetera. et cetera. But on the upper end, they're super skilled. And why that's important is these are people that had hard-won, very deep relationships with key decision makers for their very, very recently previous employer for very significant things. If you can identify them on LinkedIn, which you can because I've already done this for clients and we've done tests that, that validated it, and you can prove that your company, your, your product service is superior if they do not have a non-compete or if it's not a competitive product, they will never, because these people are making two, three, four, five hundred thousand more, and now they're sitting hoping to get unemployment, which couldn't come close to paying their car payments. So if you can contact them, persuade them that your company product service is warrantable, they have all these relationships that they can feed to you, and they'll never be receptive any other time in their life life to doing something on a performance and if they do well they can earn themselves a career opportunity finally and there's one more after this finally but finally in these categories there's a million and a half or so salespeople that can't sell something you can recruit them right now to do any of the three things i just talked about or anything else uh imaginable on a pure performance and that'll never be available to you in that way again finally there's something that i call options trading, but it's not options trading like stocks. It's getting control of assets and access. I got a lot more things, but these are the five big ones. For example, uh, uh, if you came to me and said, Jay, I got this great idea. I want to do a Jay Abraham uh, advisory letter. You don't do one and uh, I'll take it out and I'll give you <clears throat> a fee when I start of X and I'll give you uh, so much percentage and I'll give you a piece of the back end. You can literally take that right and flip it to somebody in the advisory business for a bigger amount and a bigger override. And there's all kinds of stuff like that, Joe. And those are the kind of things that I sort of function on, which are a little different than most people. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that helps. And by the way, how you're looking at me right now, if you could gaze into the eyes of everyone through their screen the rest of the time, I think there'd be a much deeper. Yeah, I'm with sorry. You. Yeah, absolutely. Pardon me. No, no, I, I'm just, I'm sort of messing with you, but then. Uh, no, it's okay. No, I tend to be, I tend to be a little bit, uh, and not intentionally distanced. I was just trying to remember what I wanted to talk about. I'm going to, I'll be deeply focusing on, on the camera. Okay. That's perfect. So like you've spoken in front of, what's the largest audience that you have ever spoken in front of? I don't know, 15,000. 15,000? Okay. I'm just trying to check, like on an arrogance level, how arrogant do you think you are? Just because, you know, so many people all over the world think you're like just this amazing genius. I don't think I'm arrogant <laughs> as, as an ego. I think I'm arrogant about the concepts. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. think it's a different, yeah. I think I'm misperceived. I really do. I, I, I not I've, I've known Jay, I've known Jay for like, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And he, he's, he's mellow. He's, uh, you know, he, he wants to be arrogant even about his ideas. And he's, he's a, he's a pussycat. <laughs> no, no, actually I, I, I've gotten to know Jay very well. I think he's a really incredibly Me kind, too. cool, awesome, uh, guy. So yeah. I, I wanted to just, I, I just want to add one like specific, like when Jay was talking about his number one, where you've got, you know, the, the companies like a, like a, a, a chiropractor, for example, who has an office and he can't take patients or he can, 
if he wanted to go one one patient at a time and he wanted to fumigate the office and he wanted to, you know, he could get away with it. But while he's doing that slowly but surely, what Jay is, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about, because it was a chiropractor in my group that you coach, Jay, and he wants to drop ship supplements for their pain. So he can't crack their back today. He can crack their back maybe a few months from now. So he free visit three months from now, but he drop ships supplements, pain supplements, or even more, there are companies like with lasers and all this kind of stuff that don't know what to do. I mean, they can sell stuff online, but if they can partner with a guy like this, who's got the network, who's got the the funnel, so to speak, of all of what he's doing. I mean, partnerships are, are I, I agree with you 100%, Jay. This is the best time to to buy as opposed to make everything. And you get to test all these different things that you might not go into those businesses anyway. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's great, Brian. Thank you. And I like your beard. You look very distinguished. Joe, if, if you think about it, very interesting that everyone needs money and people are rudderless and they're trying to figure it out. I mean, there's a real sleeper that people don't think about. All these restaurants that are on the ropes that are closed the independent ones, not, not the chains, but the independent ones have very rich, deep relationships with their clientele. And the more upscale have much more sophisticated clientele. They are great influencers. You could contact to introduce all kinds of different products or services. And that's just just a, a singular idea. And I mean, I, I, I want to be very supportive and I want to bring to your, your audience as much as I possibly can. I, I was thinking about something, if you'll let me, that I would love to share about distinguishing between a superficial partnership and something very deep. And I can tell a couple stories when you want, if you want, and if not, I will shut. My no, mouth. no, do, do it right now because there are so many people that are viewed as influencers and experts that present themselves is actually having deep relationships with people when it's just a manipulative setup sort of game. So I'd love for how you make the distinction between superficial. Yeah, well, and okay. well, so let me start by telling you how we used to do what you, you would call an affiliate before the advent. And again, I go back, everybody knows that Brian knows that to, to when there were a lot of newsletters that were physical, but when we would set up a deal and the one that I'll use as a reference is I had a very large uh, gold brokerage company when the newsletter business was very high. And most people would just try to get uh, the, 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 the editor, the personality to recommend them in a, in a, a, a letter or, or a little blurb in the newsletter. I, I did not do that. The first thing I did was set us up as the recommended provider. And every time anyone ever became a new subscriber, they got in their new subscriber welcome package, a collection of materials we created all about hard assets, all about gold, silver, the case for it, and even the case against it. So it was balanced. Number two, four times a year, we underwrote the cost of special edition newsletters that basically focused on uh, hard assets, the outlook, and, and epic uh, iconic people, sorry, I'm looking up again, forgive me, uh, people that uh, would write and they were really cool. Third is we funded quarterly regional events where we would bring an icon, we would bring the editor, we paid for everything, and then we would bring our person. Fifth is a lot of people back then would keep mailing, Brian knows this, until they hit break even, and break even would be two different things. For some, it was imputing fulfillment, which wasn't that much, $10 a year for a two, three, five hundred dollar newsletter. Sometimes it wasn't. When they stopped, we would take over funding it because we got joint tenancy of all the names. I would change the headline, the the bonuses, the risk reversal, make it a little tighter. And we would basically turn it into viable and make money on it, but we'd get joint tenancy of the name. When it stopped working, because most newsletter promotions then I think Brian would affirm and maybe today too. They were based on the bonuses, and we were in the gold business, which was lead generating, and lead generating would cost us sometimes $150 a lead before it was a deferred uh, deferred investment we wouldn't recoup for a month or two. So we would use the mailing piece for the newsletter stripped down to just the bonus just to get leads at a lower cost. But we basically, it was sort of like the concept, the integrative concept of becoming an integral part 
of the relationship. But that didn't happen until we won very, very deeply the trust of the the partner and that we protected them on everything. And we, I mean, I was very good and I think I still am pretty good at preemptively thinking through all the negatives, all the concerns, not just overcoming them, but blatantly bringing them up to show that we have already protected them. I can go on and on, but that's just one example. Michael Middleton sent me a, a, um, private question. And I said, you know what, why don't you just bring this up and ask Jay directly? So, uh, Michael, uh, if you want to, uh, unmute yourself and ask that question, let's do it. And when he does it, I have three or four points that are, I think would be fun to share sometime if you'll let me before I, I am thrown off. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Thanks, Michael. Joe. Jay, you, 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 um, just mentioned something about restaurants, which, uh, um, struck a chord with me, but I, I've been struggling to think about how to use this, but some of the high-end restaurants in London have been sending out to their mail lists recipes and, and that kind of thing, but then also linking out their their food suppliers because the wholesale food suppliers, their their businesses, sure. you know, yeah, the same thing here. All the hotels and restaurants. So, in in the in the world that some of the rest of us are in, I'm I'm struggling to think of situations where I've maybe got clients or business connections where I could use uh, the same kind of thing where we can help them uh, in, in, in this way. Michael, can, can I ask a clarifying to make sure I hear, are we talking about restaurants or are you just using restaurants as a springboard to some other industry application? Yeah, just as a springboard. I'm, I'm not in the restaurant business. I have a financial planning business and a retirement coaching business. Okay. And so your clients are whom? My clients are uh, corporates with, so companies with sort of 4,000 employees and more, uh, many of whom they've sort of furloughing staff where they're looking at redundancies. They've got people that they're going to be taking on to, to early retirement. Um, it, it, it's a new business. We had a face-to-face -face workshop program, which just got shot to bits. And, and, and Michael and Joe, I forgot I, I, it's, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I forgot a big part of, of the first element that I, I've been talking about. And that is whatever you do now, you want to identify what else people buy before, during, after, and instead. And I can go into instead. And you want to be able to make those product services available to them also. Then you want to go to the next level, Michael, and think about this. And think about what else they are buying uh, decision makers for that your your exact your 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 the trust you create would be appropriate to introduce them to and a lot of people are very vertical they only think in terms of whatever they do and the uh the transactional activity that that they they uh, deal with but if you think about the fact that that person in normal times is buying or or influencing certain things but in abnormal times they're even new things and and most of them are indiscriminate they don't know who to choose they don't know who to who to uh to go with they don't know who to really uh pick as a choice or a provider if you are in a position you've earned their trust that trust now can basically it can it can uh what's the word not crescendo it can basically expand out to a multitude of different ways you can very ethically monetize and then there's two different ways to monetize now and in the future if you know that it's only a matter of time between before certain types of products or services will be paid for you can set them up now you're going you're going to most everyone on this call is going to need money unless they're doing fabulous which some are they're going to need money worse in six days it's going to be in 60 days than they do right now okay. i don't know if that helps or i gave you a headache no 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 helps a lot <laughs> Hopefully, I can read my writing. Yeah, well, with the restaurants, anybody here who might have a, a whole uh, influence sort of chain to restaurant tours, I think you could go to a lot of them and introduce them to all kinds of qualitative people that their upper level type clientele would be very receptive to. And you have to realize one of the greatest, and you guys know this because I've watched some of the discussion with people that are doing the virtual uh, events, you're never going to have also 
that the high level decision makers captive in one place for such a period of time where they are able when you engage them to be very focused. I mean, there's a mm-hmm. lot of really interesting sort of ad- adversity produces enormously unique opportunity if you understand how to first of all identify it and then and then uh, seize it. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope it helps. Now, let me, let me say this too, because there's a few comments in here that, um, you know, Laura, who is from uh, Milan, uh, Italy, and is now in... Um, London right now. She wrote, I know personally restaurant owners in Milan who are working more than ever with the deliveries and apparently they even make more because they don't need the stuff uh, in hall waiters and uh, sommeliers. Sommeliers. You know, it shows you how uneducated I am. I'm sitting there pausing like, what is this (laughs) word? It's the guys guys who serve the wine. I I just want to say something about restaurants because I was on the phone with Frank Kern not that long ago and he said to me, if he owned a restaurant, he would um, hire um, a college, he would call up college students and high school students who are around. Now, this is, this is the, the, um, the granular idea, but I think there's a bigger idea mm-hmm. here. He would call all the college students and high school students, and he'd say, and that would be the Pony Express for delivery, but not just delivery of food. Then you start looking at a direct mail campaign. I've been home, I've been, I, I was in Milan also, I've been I've been in my house for like six weeks. And so I haven't gotten one menu from a restaurant in my town. And a lot of them are open doing delivery. Hmm. Now, that might be not be strange, but I wouldn't even just and that's just the menus. What about, you know, you have you do some direct mail. You say, you know, I want to cook you dinner tonight. And it's a one page. It's a menu. It's got the key dishes from their restaurant. I'm just I'm, I'm dreaming here. And they cross out the, the price and they give you a little discount and they have a phone number at the bottom. And then the restaurant, being more proactive, gets the phone numbers in advance and goes out and calls those people and say, did you get my menu? I want to cook dinner for you tonight. And they we repeat the message <laughs> and they take an order. And it's like, it's I, I don't know what, I, if, if there was one restaurant in my town that was doing that, I would be ordering because I want to support them. I don't yeah. want them to go out of business. And I just can't believe that. And again, I shouldn't. I should believe it because they don't think like that. And it's OK. I, I shouldn't say it that way. Let, let, but, let me let me say this, yeah, though, ahead. like because the, the biggest thing I want out of this, I mean, I'm talking about restaurants from a jumping off point of the ideas mm-hmm. that are being discussed here. But it's like, you know, the thing I mentioned yesterday, my buddy Mark Tarbell who, uh, you know, won Iron Chef and is a, a really great restaurant. He's been in business forever. Uh, and um Akira Chan, who's going to be speaking earlier, sent me a you know a video about uh, a guy who owns a Thai restaurant in Los Angeles who is going out to the community and asking people to buy meals so that he can serve them to the healthcare workers. And so right now, I checked in with Mark yesterday, and he's literally gearing all that up to not only do healthcare workers but uh, firefighters, police officers, you know, people that are being of service, and. One of the things I really want to emphasize, and I'd love to have Dean Jackson jump in on this because Dean is sure. really great at yeah, this, um, that is good. that the, val- the thing I want people to take away from Jay is that people think of the value of their products and their services. And what you've always done forever, Jay, is the value of the relationship, the value of the list, the value of how many years you spend to develop and nurture a relationship with a group of people. And so Abby uh, made this comment, restaurants are more for the social aspect, right? They could coordinate random Zoom breakout dinners. And what I'm going to do during the next Genius Network meeting during lunch is I'm going to set up breakout rooms so that people can have um, lunch with each other if they'd like and just talk to each other during lunch. And it would be like a virtual lunch. Well, all these restaurants the ones that have a relationship, a lot of independence with individuals, there's so many things that they could do to yeah. coordinate those types of relationships. Like a dry cleaner of clothing could offer to do certain cleaning and ask the community to contribute for elderly people or for sick people or people that simply can't, yeah. you know, do stuff. And so I'd like you to, you know, obviously think of uh, hearing what Jay's saying to all the different applications of how to leverage 
the value of those relationships, if that makes sense. And I know, Dean, you were going to say something, so go ahead. Look at so many jumping off points here. That, that, you missed the point, so I missed an opportunity. But here, jumping in on the restaurant one, I just did a podcast with a guy who owns a restaurant in Georgia. And, you know, same thing. People not coming to the restaurant, but they do, um, you know, Cajun um, style food. And we had them cook up home style things like cook up jambalaya and gumbo and uh, all these things that you can do in, in a, a bucket that somebody could come and get to serve over rice to feed their family. And we did um, video, Facebook video ads to in a radius, you know, just of their town there in the thing. Hi, this is Brett. I'm here at the restaurant. We're here right now. We're cooking up some really great home cooked home style uh, meals for you. We got jambalaya here. We got some gumbo here. We've got all these things that you could serve over rice. And we're going to be, uh, you know, putting them in these containers so you could just come and pick them up and take them home. And that was like a big hit for the the community, you know, because now you've got that asset. But I wanted to talk going back about the root of what's going on in the restaurant thing, because this was happening, the root of it before the coronavirus, before all of that. If we look at what's happened in the last few years of the restaurant world, we've gone from, there was, uh, I remember when it first showed up on my radar, there was an article about a uh, venture funded group in New York that had what they were coining as ghost kitchens and, and that they ghost restaurants. The article was, you know, nine, nine restaurants, uh, one kitchen, no dining room. And this group was running nine different restaurant brands from one kitchen that only existed on Grubhub and Seamless, where it's delivery services. So they had a commissary kitchen in a low rent area. They'd cut out the most expensive and unpredictable part of the restaurant business. And that's become now a, uh, that became a thing. And in the three years or so, maybe four years that all this has been happening, it's evolved to the point now where the um, uh, Travis Kalnick, the guy who was the founder of Uber, is like has ninety percent of his Uber stock sold and is in to this thing where he's investing in cloud kitchens as a, a service. Where now you can go if you have a restaurant idea, you can go and they serve. They're turning um, storage facilities with 10 by 10 things into commercial kitchens so that you can all get together. There's this line hallway of all of these commercial kitchens with a dispatch sort of delivery center. So if you want to start a restaurant brand, you can just rent this 10 by 10 commercial kitchen by the day, by the week, toggle it on and off whenever you want to show up on the app this is really the biggest thing that's happening right now is we're on the cusp of this migration from the mainland into Cloudlandia. And in Cloudlandia, there are no limitations. All of the geographic constraints, the friction, the layers of middlemen that it takes to distribute at retail – all of that is gone, and one by one, you're seeing this cascading flow of business categories that are being toppled and that are coming and doing DTC, direct-to-consumer, where you get the mattress industry has been disrupted by numerous people now, where you can buy a mattress that comes in a box and unfolds and lays there for a thousand dollars. Now you've got Casper, you've got Purple, you've got Lisa, you've got all of these ones that are doing the same thing. There's we're going to see unicorn after unicorn after unicorn, meaning billion dollar businesses that happen very quickly on the back of cutting out all of the middlemen and going direct to consumer. If you've got a physical good that can fit in a box and is desirable and you know what it is, 
when you see a picture of it on Instagram or Facebook and you can buy it because you saw some influencer talking about it, you've had the, the reach to them. We're seeing that just happen and happen and happen now. And then you're starting to see the layers of the services that make those kinds of businesses possible. I mean, we've seen in the last year, Kylie Jenner has become a billionaire on the back of, in three years, on the back of partnering with a white label manufacturer who does all of the technical, all of the difficult stuff of making the, making the, the cosmetics, packaging them, uh, distributing them, doing all of the logistics involved in it. Her mom's business handles all of the administration of it. And she's a billionaire with a team of seven people. And all they do is the creative work. They come up with with the idea, what do we want to sell? We want to do lip kits. What colors are we going to do? What are we going to name the colors? All of that stuff handed off to the distribution or the, the white label partner to do all of the difficult stuff. And then she just lets her Instagram followers and everybody know that it's available and they go directly and buy it or they go through Sephora or whatever their distribution channel is, but it breaks the internet whenever it comes out. So we're starting to see all of that. And, and often when I tell people that story, they say, well, Kylie Jenner, she's got every advantage possible. But then the greatest gift that we've been given in the last year to counter that is Lil Nas X and Old Town Road. Here's a guy with zero advantages, 20-year-old college dropout living in his grandmother's, I mean, shipping around between his siblings, found a free beat online on YouTube by another kid living in his parents' house in the Netherlands. And he makes this song, Old Town Road, and starts pumping it out to the internet. It gets picked up on TikTok, goes viral, gets on the Billboard country charts. And Billboard immediately takes it off the chart saying, oh, wait a minute now, we can't have that on there. And he tweets out, somebody get me Billy Ray Cyrus, because what's more country than Billy Ray Cyrus? He gets Billy Ray Cyrus involved in the project, and it goes to number one in the world, longest number one song of any song in the history of the Billboard charts. Not a Beatles song, not a Rolling Stones song, not anybody. Nobody's ever had a song on Billboard longer than this song, and that's all happening right now because of our direct access to every single person in Cloudlandia with a one-to-one connection and zero friction to get to them. So our ability to see those opportunities, to assess what our assets are, because we may have assets that could collaborate with other people. We may have assets that could be in the right hands and a blessing, an opportunity for somebody else to. So you got to look and see, do I have, you know, I, these fall into three categories, vision, capabilities, and reach. And we have assets in all three. So if we've got reach, if you've got access to relationships like Jay's talking about, whatever, to whatever level, you know, if you've, you're a restaurant and you've got access to whoever are your existing clients. You're a hairdresser. You're a whatever business you're in, you do have reach to your relationships. But then you start to think if you could have access or reach to somebody else's audience, I mean, at the core level, it's affiliate marketing. It's the, that's the seed of it. But what I'm talking about is something even bigger and more in depth than that is the you know, the spirit of collaboration is really what it is. It's just, I've been so, um, you know, just immersed in, in seeing all the subtleties of what's going on here. And there's so much to, to talk about. We should do another whole session uh, at some point, Joe, you and I should definitely do a podcast about this too, but I hate to, sorry to hijack this one, but that's the spirit of what Jay's saying is exactly what's manifesting right now. 
You know what we should do? Like all the questions that people have that we probably will not have enough time to get to, we should do a uh, – we'll just corral Jay and do a, another um, we'll do mm-hmm. another podcast with yeah, him. Let's on, do that. On GeniusNetworkInsights.com, you can hear the interview that me and um, Dean did with Jay, which kind of started it all. We could even bring Brian on because Brian can talk forever also mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and then go from there. But there's some freaking awesome comments. Michael uh, Middleton, who's in UK right now, said – Dean J, thank you. I think I might have I just I might have my two hundred and fifty k idea, which is great. That's great. So, so Jay, let me ask you. Um, boy, there's several things I want to ask you here. Um, what are some strategies and tactics business owners should be thinking about using to bring in cash, like right now? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, one of them is most people don't think about barter. I've set up lots of things for people, but if you have something you can create or you own that you have margin in or it's sunk cost and you and it has and it has value to anybody and you can exchange it for anything that can either be cash converted, used in lieu of what you'd buy, or there's another word, I don't want to get too sophisticated, triangulated. You can, I mean, we've done, geez, I've done 50, 60 billion, a million dollars, excuse me, of barter. And I could tell you some great barter stories. The other- I've been, I've been to your house. You have a lot of art and shit there that you've bartered over the years. I mean, and this is, I mean, truthfully, I drive a GT, I got a GTS Mercedes. I traded a day for, I got a, and I'm saying this just to demonstrate, not to be arrogant. I've got a- uh, 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 a G wagon 63 AMG. I traded two days for Christy has a Porsche. We traded for, you know, my whole backyard. I traded for, uh, I mean, it's, but, but it's, it's understanding value perception. If you have something that you have in oversupply expertise, for example, and that expertise has high perceived value and you can exchange it to somebody that you can, uh, you can, demonstrate needs it or needs the not it because you're not really selling the expertise you're selling the result the saving the money the productivity whatever it's going to be worth and you can get anything we used to do with car dealership just as an example we would create <clears throat> barter profit centers and i'll go through real quick because it's pretty cool we would basically look at and most people don't know it if you have car dealers there they know it there it's a very huge amount of of uh a volume that goes through, not just volume of cars, but just buying, purchasing, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. We would go through everything they were buying. Got to keep my eyes focused on the camera. And then we would see what we could trade for instead of purchasing. But when you're trading, you can trade soft for hard on different multiples. And I don't want to get too sophisticated, but we would trade a car for two or three times the value in something else that we would normally pay cash for. So let's say we were going to buy chemicals and we needed cleaning chemicals or lubricating chemicals. We would go to that company and we'd trade them either automobiles that normally would have, let's call it a 15% margin or less, but we would trade it two or three to one. So we would get margins of something like literally 60, 70% to our advantage for something we would normally write a check for. We would also trade for things I could liquidate on the open market for a multiple, excuse me, for a higher margin. You can trade. I don't want to get too sophisticated. You can JV with people. Again, if you have anything that you sell, you should ask, what else do people buy right now before, during, after, instead, if it's still being purchased? Then the next level is what else are my buyers buying and if they're buying it from people they don't know and they're just basically trying to find them anyhow this goes back to relationships joe you have the ability with the trust the credibility that has been very hard won by the years you've served your clients or the value you brought your clients if it wasn't yours to say look this is and and, and by the way i have a concept that's called the aikido school of marketing and the essence, anybody that knows what a keto is, it's the martial arts methodology that uses the power of the enemy against the enemy. If you use the problem to your advantage, you could say, look, 
uh, it's a little unusual for me to be introducing you to blank, but I know that you're going to be purchasing or using these services or products now, and you probably don't know who to trust. We've, we've built a very strong relationship where hopefully you trust us and our judgment. We've done a very, very comprehensive job, and we've found what we think are the best providers. We've negotiated in behalf of all of our clients a preferential price, extra terms, guarantees, bonuses, and if you don't know who to trust, we would like to very strongly recommend this. You can choose anybody you want, but we're also ombudsman. You can do things like that all day long, and I hope I'm not getting too rogue on you. No, you know what I what I like about what you just said? When I was a carpet cleaner back in 1990, one of the ways I came up with a free room of carpet cleaning was I heard a one of your I don't know how many thousands of dollars. You were the most expensive seminar guy in the world uh, back in the nineties. When I first started listening to your stuff, I I remember listening to one of your uh, first set of J Abraham tapes in 1992 was the first time. And uh, you had some carpet cleaners. And I think back then you were charging like three grand an hour or something. And they uh, could not afford you these two guys that owned the carpet cleaning business. And so they scraped up $2,000 to hire you. And I think you gave them 45 minutes for two grand. And what you told them is you explain lifetime value of a, of a customer and you are great at explaining, you know, the whole J. Abraham, you don't know how much you can afford to spend until, until and unless you know how much a client is actually worth to you. And so you would explain to them, you know, lifetime value of a customer and go out and spend a month giving away carpet cleaning for free because what will happen is you will develop reciprocity and then they will refer you and they'll do business right. with you again. And so what happened is they went to churches and they uh, trade shows and, and neighborhoods and just offered like an entire houses of carpet cleaning and people would tip them and they'd refer them and, and things like that. And I was like, huh, you know, so, so I was like, what if I just gave away a free room of carpet cleaning? And so I started doing that. And then I created a thing called a carpet audit because I didn't want to do a free co- quote. I wanted to do something different. And I developed this system for myself. And then I went to a dry cleaner of clothing was my first joint venture who was already had a developed a relationship with people that were bringing their clothing. And I said, can I clean the carpets in your house or your, uh, or your uh, dry cleaner here uh, to show you the, the services I do? And if you like it, then can we talk about offering services to your clients? Because I wanted him to see my, uh, you know, my, my services. And so he agreed to let me do his, uh, the store. And so I cleaned the front entrance. It wasn't a ton of carpet, but it was the front entrance to this dry cleaner. Now what happened is I instilled reciprocity. But then over, uh, over like the first year, uh, he referred me and I gave him 10% uh, commission of every job that I did. And, and uh, he referred $25,000 worth of business to me that year. Uh, and what my offer was, was a free room of carpet cleaning to all his clients. And another thing that I learned through you is that if you offer someone a gift, even if they do not avail themselves of it, you still get the benefit of the reciprocity by giving, and, and you genuinely do it. You don't want to do it as a gimmick. You, I mean, no. if you are offering something to someone, you give it to them, right? And so what ended up happening was all of these people that stopped going to this dry cleaner, I asked after I did a few jobs and people reported back, I was like, can I have your list? And I will call them. I will physically, there was no internet back then. Yeah. This was like literally manual marketing, right? And putting postcards and signs on his store. I even uh, got him to put little door hangers over the clothing that said, you know, ask yeah. us about our free carpet cleaning. But here's the point as it relates to everybody is I then started teaching carpet cleaners to go out and say they're going to hire a landscaper, a pool cleaner, an electrician, a painter, a pest control company, all of these, you know, asphalt, like everything, uh, you know, and they're going to, you have a relationship with them, you know, different service businesses. And the fact is like, why is your interior designer writing to you about a carpet cleaner? Why is your carpet cleaning writing to you about a real estate agent? And all of a sudden it became this whole joint venture thing. And so every time one of my carpet cleaners wanted to add another hundred grand to their business, I would say, who is the joint venture or refer that you can develop and establish a relationship with that can refer that business to you? And right now that opportunity, I think exists in greater levels than ever before, because, you know, 
there's this anxiety and there's all these people trying to figure out and, and many of the comments that people have posted here with these ideas. I mean, I think that's just a way to look at it. And I only bring this up because I was a Debro carpet cleaner that was just trying to figure out how to learn marketing, still doing the carpet cleaning myself. And I still manage to build and grow my business doing all this sort of stuff. And now with that level of knowledge and, and how easy it is with the internet and the, and the spreading of messages, uh, there's just such a, a great, and the need of it is such a great opportunity. Joe, if, if you like, you know this. I mean, we've done, I, I, I've got 150 different ways to do strategic alliances, JVs, co-branding partner, barter, everything. If you like, we've got, geez, I don't know, three or four programs that we have sold for a lot, but we don't push them very much. I'll be happy to give you uh, the best one or ones and you can put them on your your member's site and give them free to everyone as long as they don't banter them to anybody else, if that helps. That would be wonderful. Yeah, let's discuss the best stuff that you have, and I will uh, I will make that available. Sorry, I was not. I was doing a Jabraham thing. I was looking all over the place. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm sorry about that. But let, let me make uh, a couple of points because you did. I mean, people don't realize when I started, the way I got notoriety was Nightingale Conant was popular. We had created Money Making Secrets, Mister X. I met Vic Conant. I sent him the book. He liked it. I said, look, will you send this book if I give you one of them to every one of your, it had about a hundred key iconic business and, and uh, skill set experts. I said, ask them to read it. If they like it, I will buy each one of them an hour of my time. Uh, and if they like it and I give them great ideas, ask them if they'll endorse me. And if they don't, don't. And I got 80 of them that endorsed me and I had to invest literally two full months of my time for nothing. But the payoff residual that I got out of those relationships and the aggregate credibility was off the wall. Yeah. You know what? I have, I have to mention this, Jay, just because you just kind of set it up. So here's the Nightingale Conant Piranha Marketing Program, the seven success multiplying factors to dominate any market you enter. And me and Tim Polson did this in 2004. And this is the number one selling marketing program of all time at Nightingale Cone. It sold millions of dollars worth of this program back then. And it's, and, and you know what, you just said a great thing. I, uh, all of these authors, all of it, what it is, is it's their sphere of influence, right? It's these, re, it's these relationships. And uh, one of the things that I think I've, I've learned mostly from you is that the value of a properly or well leveraged relationship or endorsement is worth way more money in long term value than just selling stuff. And I think that's where people kind of miss it, you know? It, well, it goes here's what people don't think about. I, somebody, I mean, I'm a great synthesizer of much brighter people that have mentored and influenced me. But somebody made a point that just blew my mind right when I got really aware of the power of this. And we did it, you know, Icy Hot, we did it with it. Entrepreneur Magazine, we did it with it. Uh, the Gold Business, I did it. My brand, we did a quarter billion dollars, Joe, of seminars when I was in that business, all on relationships. But somebody made a point. He said, if you were an investor, what would you, would you like to have access to tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of assets at work for nothing. And you would get, he put it in an analogy, sort of what the yield would be. And if you think about it, these relationships, and it's a little different in, in the online marketing probably, but in, in the other worlds, these people have spent millions and millions of dollars a year on their business, on their teams, on their technology, on their service people, on their support people to build goodwill. And you're able to leverage off of all of that either or for a percentage of the reward of just on a performance basis or for reciprocating or for giving them your products or services instead. And, and when you realize that the, the sheer aggregate asset pool and resource pool and predisposed credibility, pardon me, credibility pool that you're able to access. And then you figure out, for example, with your people, they've got their relationships, they've got their clients' relationships, they've got their clients' clients' relationships. And the, and the, the crescendo effect is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's off the chart exponential. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you this, Jay. 
Uh, and I'm going to kind of combine two questions. Um, so the first one is how should business owners be thinking about their team members and what team members should business owners be on the lookout to add during a time like this? And secondly, and I'll combine them, the other question was how can uh, salespeople be utilized by business owners more effectively during a down market or a crisis like this? So it's really about how to leverage a lot of the people that are on here. They have teams and some have many employees. I mean, we have uh, some Genius Network members that have over a thousand employees, uh, a lot of salespeople, and some are in a position where they, you know, have to lay them off. Uh, and others, you know, how how do you best leverage them? So, do you have any thoughts or ideas on that? Yeah, but may I, I always like to tell uh, a- a- anecdotal and, and empirical based stories? Can I please? No, oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go through dating myself. Uh, it sounds a little weird. Uh, but but if you think about in, in the days before computers became marginalized, they were sold by very professional teams. And I had a prospective client I almost made a deal with who was in trouble, and they were doing about $50 million selling expensive computers in the days before, and they had about 40 salespeople doing it. And I had made a deal to sell their sales force for hundreds of thousands of dollars of fixed fee and a percentage of the residual to another company right before uh, this company went bankrupt and the trustee fired everybody. And the same thing with moving the accounts. So I think it's looking at how to repurpose. There's a couple things. I've done enormous work with sales forces where if you, this is a, a, a totally different, but it's very powerful. I have a concept called, uh, PEQ optimization, performance enhancement quotient. Basically, if you start with people that have a lot of salespeople doing the same thing, whether they're internal, external, uh, captive, uh, uh, independent, what you find out is if you go into into analyzing granularity, different people excel at different things. The the intent of, I mean, the expectation is everybody's omnipotent. They're not. Some are better at opening accounts. Some are better at closing accounts. Some are better at at uh, selling different products. Some are better at holding margins. Some are better at vertical type industries. When you find the people that are better, you sort of the Deming process of process improvement, you want to find out what they do better, how much better, and teach those elements that you can codify them to everybody. But if they're five or six times better, you want to make them a specialist. So that's the first thing if your people are still performing, you want to do because you can make your entire sales force and the sales process 10, 15, 20% better almost overnight doing that. If the if the people that are selling can't sell right now what you sell, I would look at what I said. What's the influence they normally have? What else do they buy? How can you, I mean, I always made a lot of money for people by finding quality people that couldn't market or sell, but had the capacity to scale up and getting total control of their distribution and taking it to markets they couldn't penetrate or to distribution mechanisms, access vehicles that they couldn't. So that's another. The third, I hope I'm not being too abstract. I'm loving this and I'll get, I mean, you got me turned on now. This is fun. But if you look at all these salespeople out there, now you can divide and conquer. You can look at people that have specific connections to specific either industries or influencers and figure all kinds of wonderful ways to use them if they're not working. You can go to companies that have those people. And like my son uh, has, my son has, uh, he works for a company that sells an injectable like Botox. They're keeping their salespeople on, but they can't sell anything right now because no one's buying, but they have relationships with all these dermatologists and all these entrepreneurial doctors that want to make more money. If I were doing what you said, I would go to all the, I would either go to the company first, if they still have a sales force, introduce to them something else that their salespeople could pre-sell to these doctors, a, a, a lead generating system, an online marketing system, referral gen. We have 225 ways to generate referrals, all those things. And it would monetize now and residually for that company or that company could take that over. I mean, is, am I, am I getting too abstract? No, no, it, it's, it's amazing. I think it's awesome. And by the way, let me just make you aware, uh, cause your team, I, Brian's on here supposed to yank you off in five minutes because of whatever you have Hello, right Nancy. after this. I'm having fun. Let me see if I can extend it. And I'd like, you know, I was going to like ask. Uh, yeah, uh, Brian, why don't you see if Brian's on, 
see if you can buy me another 20 or 25 minutes. I'll tell you what I'm doing, by the way, because this is, this is a great example. One of my former clients publishes the definitive journal uh, for radio station executives. And they're on, I mean, anybody who's here in the radio business, they're on the ropes. I mean, they've lost uh, tons of billing. Uh, you know, they've got, you know, you can't save the un- unused time. You, you lose it. And we went to 15,000 and offered to, to, for me to help them monetize it in exchange for spots. And I've got dozens and well, hundreds that have responded that want me to help them. And we're trying to syndicate stuff that'll monetize for them. So it's sort of fun. But I, I would love to continue because I really, I mean, you're one of my favorite people and you appreciate my uh, zaniness and my that and my, and my crazy rogue brain. So I'm, I'm enjoying this and I'm sure Brian could buy me. 15 or 20 minutes, if you want it. No, well, I, I, you want, yeah. You want me to yeah, call Desiree? Great. I'll call Desiree? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not my Brian I met, but I mean, not you, Brian. I, we have our Brian who was on, but if he didn't, I'm, you can do it. I'm hey, handling it. I got it. Gracious of you. You know what I really liked about that, though, is that right at that moment, Brian Kurtz was Thought getting ready him. to become your assistant. I and love I think it, that Brian. That was awesome. And Brian, have, you have been Jay's assistant for like 30 years. We're keeping ours on payroll. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Brian, can you uh, can you order me a gluten free pizza right now? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I, 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 I already right. did, Joe. It's, it's on the way. Yeah, that's very right. gracious. Thank you for the for the gesture. I think my Brian is on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. So here, let me mention this. Uh, I got to read what Patrick Gen Tempo wrote because I think it's uh, it, it, not not to take us off. I just thought it was a great comment. So uh, Patrick wrote, uh, COVID-19 has proven that no matter how remote, no matter what race and socioeconomic status, we are all irrepressibly connected. If this virus can reach anywhere, even when we are trying to physically isolate, then so can hope be spread directly and irrepressibly. I mean, that's really great. Yeah, that is good. And I saw him, it was sad. I saw Patrick right before everything stopped. He came to my office with uh, his team. And, and uh, I know him in a couple different ways. I know him with Paul Pilzer, a friend of both of ours. And yeah, uh, yeah he's a really, really impressive guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Super Jay, smart can dude. I just say that, that you're uh, just a quick comment on that. Uh, your uh, that interview was brilliant and it's going to, the world is going to see it at some point for sure. No, that was very uh, gracious. I think I mean, it was nice. They came and interviewed me for, for a project, but uh, yeah, but he's a really cool guy, very bright and very, very quality. I think that what you have attracted, Joe, and, and I want to affirm something, and I'm sure all your members know it, besides being one of the real good guys, you have attracted some of the most qualitative and collaborative-minded people. I've done a couple of, of, of uh, statements for you, but I want to just be very public. I am so impressed with, for no ulterior motive than just my appreciation of of ethos and contribution and value creation that you've created an environment where people really do go out of their way and share openly and freely the, the, the attributes, the knowledge, the methodologies. And I think it's really wonderful and I'm very proud of it. And I'm very, very pleased and honored to be able to contribute a little bit. I, I so appreciate it. Thank you. And yeah, that's what we try to do. You know, the whole life gives to the giver and takes from the taker sort of thing. Great. And so that's, yeah. yeah. Thank and you. And Jay, you're the one that told us it's our moral obligation to do it. So it it goes around. So it's okay. It, 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 I mean, it is, I was very blessed and Joe knows this, everybody. And it's something that I would urge everyone to really reflect on. We created something years ago, but it was not original. I borrowed it actually from a, I derivatized it from Phillips Publishing, believe it or not. Brian, and then I expanded it, but it's called the strategy of preeminence. And it's, it's an ideology. It's a, a strategic philosophy that you instill to be seen in the world of your, your audience is the only viable choice, the most trusted advisor for life, but it has with it corresponding responsibilities in order to achieve that outcome. And it's pretty cool, but it is, you have the moral responsibility. If you know that your company, your product or service is going to make a bigger difference in the life, the outcome, protect, enhance, enrich, uh, whatever it's going to do, you can't let the prospective person not use you. You can't let them choose an alternative that's not going to be as effective. You can't let them buy less than they should and less quantity, quality, or frequency, not because you're going to be the loser, but because they are. It's a pretty cool concept. Yeah. 
Let me uh, speak to a couple of things. People are asking about getting access to your, uh, your program that you talked about. You know what I will do? I mean, let me discuss with you what I think will be most relevant that I you have. I got three or four of them. And the only thing I would say is I'm not about uh, a form. I'm more of a function. So it's pretty, I'm pretty uh, really wild entrepreneurial mad scientist. But the content, we've got one that's got 150 case studies that might be very useful as far as modeling and referencing and i'll be happy to give you whichever one you want yeah get get them over to me and i will i will send them out and i really i'll I'll put those on the membership site for genius network members thank thank you uh and uh jeff madoff i'm gonna ask you in a moment to ask your question to jay uh that you sent me privately about so um yeah and some people have uh by the way the couple people have talked i i mentioned the um the the Piranha Marketing Program, we can still get that stuff on Audible because Nightingale licensed their stuff to Audible. So if anyone Without wants- Without our permission, by the way. What's that? Without our permission, by the way. I, still, well, they're, I get my $2,000 checks every quarter. What's that? I get my $2,000 checks every quarter. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how what happens when you don't keep up with the times and what, what will happen to all, into all the knowledge. It's, it's fascinating. Great. So- um, yeah, so Jeff, uh, Jeff, by the way, uh, who you know, Jeff Madoff, uh, Jay, yeah. he's in, uh, you know, New York and earlier today, you know, I mean, it's, that's in one of the hardest, yeah, of course, uh, most difficult cities right now in, in America. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, okay. Jeff. Hey, Jay. I love the glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Lots of people are dealing with lots of fear right now. It's a scary time. A lot of people are having to figure out what to do with their business, as Joe referenced, what to do with the people that work for them. Uh, And you said, and I agree, that adversity also breeds opportunity. Yes. Uh, Creativity often comes from crisis. Yes. Uh, so one of the things we're seeing in New York, for instance, is that grocery stores are doing more business than ever. The problem they have, and this goes to actually, uh, Dean Jackson's point is implementation because they don't have enough delivery people. Yes. So there's a surge in business, but they don't have the delivery people to deliver enough. So they can't keep up with the demand. So there are businesses like here, Zoom is doing an amazing business now. Uh, wasn't doing an amazing business two months ago. So there are opportunities that come up, but there's also fear that comes up with a lot of people. And I'm going to quote somebody now that you all, everybody listening might know of. Uh, And the quote is, what I learned is that which you fear and don't face controls you. That which you fear and take steps to face, you can control or at least get better at dealing with. I like it. You reckon? That's Joe Polish's quote. It's actually out of my book that's coming out. Uh, but the point is, and I, and what I wanted to ask you, Jay, is, you know, amidst the philosophy and the optimism, there is a real fear out there. Of and, and people are having to confront that fear. And what I'm wondering is, how do you overcome the fear and move forward? at a time that's, that is unlike anything any of us have ever experienced before. Okay, well, I'm gonna give you a knee jerk, it's like a great war shock. So I'll give you a knee jerk and I haven't thought about it. And with you, give me uh, the latitude, I'll come back with a better answer privately with you. And if it's a good one, you can publish it. But I think you have to divide and conquer. There's gonna be two audiences, ones that really aren't going to be able, short and quick, to grasp it. And you have to basically, you know, it's sort of Christians and lions to start with. And I'm not trying to be uh, a horrific human being. I'm being clinical, if that makes sense. And I think you're well, free to that. So the first is I'm a great believer in, you know, it, if you look at physics, basically you expand or you contract, you grow or you die, you don't stay static, uh, you either become a multiplier or a diminisher in all aspects of life. I think if we recognize that we can't control what has happened, but we can control our ability to find opportunities in it, and that's just a declaratory statement. And then with that, we, have, we can have certainty within uncertainty, if that doesn't sound 
contradictory. I mean, I can promise you this. Uh, what I love, I was very ingrained early in my career in Socratic thinking. And the reason was that if you ask enough questions, if you turn the Rubik's Cube enough ways, if you look at it from enough CAT scan sort of perspective vantage points, honest to goodness, you will always find pay dirt anywhere, even in adversity. But the problem, I was trained, Jeff, also in optimization, highest and best use theory, getting a maximum result from time, effort, opportunity, access, people, capital, resources. But the problem with optimization and the problem with answering your question for most people and the advantage that I've gotten quite accidentally is you can't optimize with the limited context of what's possible. The more you travel outside of a given reference frame, the more options, alternatives you have, the more power you possess. And it's really about wielding what I'll call ethical integral power, but you can't really know your power until you know the possibilities. And I don't know if that's too abstract for you. Well, listen, I wish that I had the intelligence to understand what you guys have been talking about for the last 45 minutes. So, uh, so it's an abstraction on an abstraction. Okay. Well, uh, you try to be a little bit more concrete. Yeah, I would. I actually, I would love you to be a little more concrete because I'd like to take this down to the people, and I'm sure there are many who are on this that are concerned about the struggle they're facing and how to bridge from now to after this. Okay. And so, okay, so whatever business you are in, you got to stop and ask: Is that business going to probably endure or stall or stop? either now or when it goes forward because that you got its fork in the road i believe so it either is or it isn't we accept that mm -hmm. yes if it is then how do i optimize ethically well first thing is you look at the weaker players and you see if you can consolidate because if you've got a structure that's solid and you've got infrastructure that can absorb a lot you can grow by by consolidating and you can be very beneficial by giving, uh, giving revenue to somebody who's not going to be able to thrive anyhow. Second is you see what other complementary products or services that are logical, and then you go to the next level, whatever else is within the realm of credulity for you to offer to the buying influence. So you start in there. Then you look at how many ways you can repurpose resources for other people, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's salespeople, whether it's distribution, whether it's uh, whether it's process, whether it's methodology, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Start there. And then if you cannot, you look at skills. You look at what you've got both in, again, infrastructure, skill set, and look at other things that you can instantly or rapidly, low cost, low risk, high probability, apply those same things to in almost any other area. Because if you think about it, I'm a marketer. You're a marketer. Joe is a marketer. I've done over a thousand industries. I mean, and, 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 you know, some more successful than others, but it is strategy marketing. Uh, it's, it's being preemptive, being preeminent, being, being, being able to understand the mind and the math and, and, and the madness of a typical audience, but it's not really, it, it doesn't really matter. Does it? If you look at people who pivoted, a lot of the pivots go from one totally different. I mean, I can't remember one of the famous companies started off in something really stupidly different. I think you have to be open minded to explore and examine your your options, your alternatives, your 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 possibilities, and then and then you look. I mean, I I mentally for clients and myself create a matrix or a template of different things, viability, probability, resource allocation, expedience, yield, current. I mean, I think you, you have to be able to sort of integrate a bunch of those at the same time. And I don't know if that's still too abstract for you. No, I mean, uh, it, it's not. It, it's interesting. And I think, you know, one of the Patrick just made a, a uh, chat comment that was fascinating about entrepreneurship. Uh, and about artistry and so on. And so when I was reading that, listening to what you were saying, then thinking about you, Joe, because your business really built on personal crisis. And that's how you 
eventually became as successful as you are because you went through crisis. And I think that crisis can be a tremendous fuel if it doesn't freak you out and you can't get out of bed in the morning. And so, and you're talking about Jay, what you do when you do get out of bed in the morning, here's how you look at these things and here's what to do. So I think we're at a very unique time, that fork in the road you're talking about. And I think that the creativity and crisis and dealing with that adversity, and as again, you said, Jay, adversity brings about opportunity. All of these together are very combustible and I think very potent mix to do new things and create new opportunities. I love the visual and the igniting. But one other thing that I would commend everybody, and I, I've, uh, I've told this to people all my life. So I'm an accidental uh, uh, industry tourist. I accidentally became uh, what looked terrible in the beginning, a, a job transient. And then it became a great attribute because I was able to understand how to combine elements from all kinds of different industries that people didn't know. And I was the one eyed man in the, in the land of the blind. I think it's essential for people now to travel outside of whatever industry they're in and whatever methodology of selling, marketing, anything, and force themselves to examine, experience all kinds of things outside. I used to have people, we have a program, which I'll gladly give you also, Joe, called Do Things Differently. It's just how to think about things totally different than everybody else. But I used to have people on weekends when they they could go to their local convention hotel and walk through and just sit in if the people would let them on five or six uh, seminars and conventions or conferences going on in totally different arenas and try to see what they could learn. When we did seminars, I would basically, back when bookstores existed, we would get a thousand different out of print, but but uh, timeless books and magazines on topics that were either business or skills and or hobbies. And we would find people that uh, would acknowledge what they, are, what they loved, like mechanical things or artistry things. And we would give them the opposite, send them to their room to read two chapters or two, uh, two articles and make them come back and present to their group distinctions they got they'd never thought about that had direct implication and application to their business. And I think breakthroughs, if you look at them historically, do not come from within an industry. They come from without. Uh, you know, uh, Rogaine was from basically, I think, pimples. Viagra was a heart. Uh, uh, fiber optics was aerospace, not communication. I don't remember all the things. FedEx basically, basically mirrored the hub and scope spoke system that the Federal Reserve Bank cleared. I think more than ever, you got to get your creativity expanded way beyond the normalcy of where you normally hunt. Yeah, you know, and by the way, let me say this, Jay, because I want I want to see if I can find this comment from Pedro, uh, who's the challenge expert. I'd like to meet him. I hear he's really brilliant. He's on here right now, and I'm going to connect you guys. Uh, If you're fine, I'll send you both a text. He wrote, the strategy of preeminence is one of my main guiding philosophies that has changed my life forever. Oh, that's so great. And I promise, Jay, you may not know this, but you have booked calls right now that all of them have been pushed off all the way through 6 p.m. Pacific time. So I'm going to get you off here in in like a minute and a half or so. Let me read this. Patrick Gentempo, the conversation stimulated this thought. Otters... I think are the most important people in the world right now. I'm not just talking about people who draw, paint, or sculpt. I'm referring to creative geniuses. No matter the vocation, those who see things differently and apply creativity to their actions, and artists can simply lift our spirits or perhaps change the world profoundly. That's what entrepreneurs do. Sandra made a great comment. I'm going to actually read this after we kick Jay off. Uh, And then uh, Patrick then followed up to me. Jay is not a marketer. He is an artist who does marketing. Just like Hendrix was not a guitarist, he was an artist who played guitar. Mm, that's nice. Thank you, Pat. So, Jay, any, uh, any famous last words that you can do in, a, in under a minute? Yeah, I mean, I think that the most important thing in the world is that I mean, we probably all feel very challenged, but I don't think we realize the capacity uh, of, of identification and, and ethically exploiting opportunities that will never be as abundant right now. It requires you to have great flexibility, but I'll tell one last point. 
years and years ago, everybody knows I was afraid to fly and wouldn't go anywhere. It was hilarious. Then one day I realized I could die sitting around, so I might as well die seeing the world. And I started flying, and I was sitting one time on one of the very first 747 SPs, the long ones in Australia, leaving. And uh, we were flying, and I looked out the window, and I was scared shitless that the damn the damn uh, wings were, you know, they were, they were whatever the word is, something like 20 feet. And I happened to be sitting next to a deadhead pilot and I was commenting, I was scared. And he said, you don't understand. If you didn't have that flexibility, the first time you hit uh, turbulence, it would break off and fall to earth. So we need flexibility in our lives more so today. And that flexibility is manifest in expanded uh, exploration of opportunities reflection on what business we can really be in, how many better, better, different, expanded ways we can serve our clients, how many ways we can repurpose our assets, our access, how much more possibility exists and how we can be value creators in terms of what our markets define as value, not us, as the world changes. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate you and I really love the fact that you've allowed me to contribute.